Here we'll be looking at how to set up a simple experiment for measuring the rate of respiration using something called a respirometer which you can buy or you can construct using some cleverness and some simple apparatus that you have lying around. We're also going to talk a little bit about ethical issues when doing respirometer and respiration related uh, experiments where you're going to be having little invertebrates or possible other plants. But mostly the ethical issues come up when you're going to be working with little bugs of some sort. So here is a sketchy drawing of a respirometer and here's the different parts that are involved. Let's just look at what's going on here. So. You need to have the little place for a little bug to be the invertebrate where you're looking that you're looking at. Since you're going to be measuring its production of carbon dioxide or its uptake of oxygen, concentrations uh, are important or volumes are very important. If you can measure it with a kind of a digital probe, you can actually kind of measure the percentage changes. In this case, this experiment is set up to measure the actual volume changes of oxygen being used. Um, but in this case, because oxygen is being used and carbon dioxide is being produced, we need to get rid of the volume effects of one of them. And so that's why you have some potassium hydroxide solution here, which is going to help to absorb some of that extra carbon dioxide so that any volume changes that we detect are only only going to be from the production of, uh, sorry, the, the uptake of oxygen or the use of oxygen during respiration as well too. So this is going to help maintain constant temperatures for the air that's in there. As you know, an increase in temperature can cause expansion quite a bit, especially for gases. And so even if the temperature changes, increases just a teeny bit, the volume can change as well. And that's going to give you a misreading. It's going to make you think that some air is being produced by this organism. Same thing if it's colder, uh, it's going to contract and shrink. And you're going to think that this bug has used a lot more oxygen than it probably has. There's a little column of liquid here called a manometer. When I first read this, I thought this was a device for measuring my relative level of manliness. And and I wouldn't have scored high there. But that's not what it's for. It's actually for measuring the pressure acting on a column of fluid. And that's going to help you figure out basically if the actual volume is changing. So these are all the bits and pieces of what's going on here. Um, I think I've mentioned all of this already. So if you're setting up an experiment, that's what you're going to do. This is a really important aspect here, this potassium hydroxide solution to help absorb the carbon dioxide so you can monitor the volume changes. Ethical implications of using little invertebrates, love these little guys. They're called wood lice or little roly-poly bugs. They roll up, but don't do anything to make them roll up. Otherwise, that means you're not being ethical because you could possibly be causing it to suffer, feel pain, be harmed, or be put at risk. So you need to determine whether the animal will suffer any of this kind of stuff. Um, when using animals for any of your investigations, biology extended essay, your internal assessment, your IA, or any labs that you're planning to practice for your real IA, you really have to go through the process deeply of thinking about uh, if you're going to use live organisms. And if you are, you have to make sure that you've gone through every single step to avoid doing so and only use them if there's nothing, no tissues that can be used to replace, there's no models or simulations. We know that in real life, uh, people do use animals and organisms to do experiments. That's the real way science works and that's the most realistic model you can use, which is a living organism before we're willing to test drugs on ourselves, right? But because we're in high school and maybe our work, I'm quoting the IB, our work is not cutting edge or substantial. It's unlikely that we'll be contributing. It's so depressing when they say this stuff. It's unlikely that we're contributing to real world findings. We should therefore minimize the amount of damage that we cause to the ecosystems and living organisms. And that does make sense. So really put a lot of thought into it if you're going to do something like that. And even if you are, you have to make sure you are not changing their particular environment substantially. Make sure what you're investigating, what you're changing, won't be that different from what they might experience in their natural habitat. So for example, don't put a cigarette next to this guy and make this guy smoke because he's probably not going to be smoking cigarettes. I don't know, maybe they go to, you know, 
smoking bars or something like that. But if that's not what they're used to, then don't do an experiment where you're testing the effect of nicotine on respiration rates, for example. So think about other options. Can you replace it with a model? All these types of options and things you need to think about when doing any kind of experiment that uses live organisms.